Well, I'd like to take a moment and welcome all of you to our service commemorating the most important event of human history. Uh, we're today, uh, Jesus Christ's day, we celebrate his resurrection from the dead. Uh, Easter service, if you would. A very unique situation today. Uh, you, usually, I can count on Easter service being our record service of the year. And attendance-wise, I'm speaking. Well, that's not going to be the case this year, and not just for us, but all through our nation. Many of you know, but you're in your homes, and I'd like for you to, uh, in your homes to realize that the church is not this building and not these chairs. And sit around uh, after the service is over. Uh, talk to your children. Talk to your spouse about the meaning of Christ's resurrection. Well, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer at this moment, uh, and. Uh, I'd like you to join me in prayer. Father, we do thank you for uh, the opportunity to come to your throne. We thank you for uh, the fact that you came to Calvary. You died for our sins. Uh, you laid in a grave for three days. And after those three days were over, you came out of that grave alive. As we celebrate that event today, uh, we ask that you would be with each one of our hearts and that everyone can truly say, that you are Lord of their life. And Father, if they can say that at this point, we trust before the service is over, uh, that would be the case. Well, before I read the scripture and before I begin the sermon, uh, we have a special music from Miss Tracy, and she's going to sing for us, and then I'll come back with the sermon.
I know many of you, or most of you, are not here with us today, but some of you have been with us and, uh, for, for decades, and we've always opened up our resurrection sermon with the same greeting uh, that the early church did. Uh, the early church found uh, confidence in, in standing against the oppression of Rome and many other uh, institutions by the fact that Jesus Christ had, had came out of the grave alive. You're in your homes, you're in your cars, you're in your garage. I'm going, uh, but here's how they greeted each other. The pastor would say, he is risen, and the congregation would say, he is risen indeed. I will not get to hear your response because you're in your homes, you're all over the place uh, because of this virus. But I will do my role and you feel free to do your role in your homes. But we'll begin right now. He has risen. He has risen. He has risen. Well, amen. And, and so uh, we, we want now to open God's Word and look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you would take your Bibles and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'd like to read the first four verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. Paul uh, spent the whole chapter 15 describing to us the importance of Jesus' resurrection. And so I would encourage you, we don't have time uh, to fit in the time we're allotted for a sermon, the entire chapter. But uh, in your privacy, your home today, uh, Resurrection Day, why don't you read 1 Corinthians 15? All the truths there, I sure, will be beneficial to you. So I'll begin reading in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Uh, the word for gospel is you anglion, and it means good news. Actually, uh, the gospel is great news. Uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The God of the universe, the perfect God, came in human flesh, lived a sinless life, went to Calvary and died on our behalf. He laid in a grave for three days and then he came out of that grave alive. And we celebrate that today. Uh, uh, and so Christian teaching on the resurrection and Christian teaching uh, cannot stand, Paul says, unless Christ uh, conquered death. Uh, no one can escape death. 155,000 people a day worldwide die. That is two persons per second. The city of Evansville here in Indiana is 116,000 people. At that rate, the entire city of Evansville would die within 45 minutes. And so we, we know that none of us can escape physical death. But can we escape death? Well, I'm here to tell you we can't. The Bible says that we can escape death because Jesus Christ conquered death. Now, I'm not saying that we won't physically die. Every one of us will physically die. We're, I think we're all aware of that. 
But we now have hope uh, that that death will not conquer us. And so, uh, but, uh, and we stand on the scriptures. Any, any Christian principle should stand on the scriptures. Solo scriptura and scripture alone. Uh, that, that, that solo scriptura is, is, should be the basis of any church. And, and it should be the basis of this church. Uh, the Bible should be the focus of attention in every church. Uh, and, and I want to uh, warn any of you that uh, maybe uh, do not feel comfortable hearing scripture. Uh, the church that does not put emphasis on the Bible actually handicaps its people. Uh, Paul, on two different occasions in four verses, pointed out to us that our hope, the hope that we celebrate today, the fact that Jesus is alive, we find that in Scripture. This isn't hearsay. As a matter of fact, any theological point you have that doesn't base itself on Scripture or any theological point that I have that does not base itself on Scripture is actually a scriptural opinion. But solo scriptura should be the rallying call of every church on this day as we speak about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and so, so we, we see this truth. Now if we only had the cross, then sin would win. And, and while you're in 1 Corinthians 15, look in verse 17 and 19 with me. And uh, Paul continues, uh, continues his, his uh, defense of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The whole chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians is just that. Uh, and as he continues his defense, he says in verse 17, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. Now, I do believe that uh, the Christian principles of the Bible, uh, but I'm here to tell you, even if some of these truths uh, were not true, uh, we still would benefit at least morally and, and societally and, and physically by Christian principles. But what Paul is saying, if, if you and I are placing our hope and, and our confidence in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his body is still laying in the Middle Eastern tomb, then, then, then we're foolish. We're miserable. Uh, we, we should have just taken the, uh, the, the rallying call of many of those who reject uh, the Christ of the Bible. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Uh, but we all know better than that. Uh, we all know that's not the case. Since the resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential to our justification, without the resurrection, we are still in our sins. Uh, what a terrible thought. Uh, Romans 4.25 says, Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Uh, Jesus Christ died at Calvary, but Jesus Christ did not deserve to die. Uh, he died for my sins. He died for your sins. Uh, he, he came and, and he lived a very unique life. Uh, now Jesus Christ was 100% human. He also was 100% God. It doesn't add up to 200%. It adds up to one person uh, with, with two natures. Uh, to be honest with you, I could spend the rest of this sermon trying to explain to you how they interact and how they work. But I, I, I would always come up lacking because uh, no one has a true answer for that. But he was 100% man. Uh, he needed food. He needed rest. He needed air. He needed many things that you and I need uh, to exist. But he lived his life so much differently than you and I. Uh, not just uh, in, in his nature, but in his character. He lived his life without sin. Uh, that, that's more than you and I can even imagine. Uh, you know, I, one thing that I've been frustrated about my entire Christian journey is how sin keeps popping its ugly head up and how I keep fighting the same battles. Uh, you know, I, thought, I used to think that I would be so much further along uh, in, in controlling uh, many of my uh, sin nature habits at this point in life. I remember when I was a teen, I used to think, oh, it would be so nice when I become an adult. It will be so nice when I'm married. And I had all these boxes I used to check off. Even I used to sit in chairs like you are. And uh, I used to say, boy, if I was a pastor, 
uh, dealing with sin would be so much easier. But to truth the matter, I've checked all those boxes off and I still find myself fighting many of the sin battles that I've literally fought since a teenager. And so we see here that Jesus lived his life without sin. What an amazing thought. Uh, you know, if Jesus had only died at Calvary, uh, then, then there would be no remission for our sins. The word sin in Greek is hamarte, and it means to miss the mark. Uh, an era of understanding. There's many listen to me right now that you have found somebody in your family or you found somebody in your neighborhood or somebody you work with that's much worse than you. So, so you are a sinner, but you know you're not bad like them. You, you never killed anyone. You never, you never robbed a liquor store. Uh, uh, you, you, you never cheated on your wife. Uh, uh, you, you never did many of the things that many people uh, uh, point to as error. But the Bible says it's not that way. Uh, the Bible says it's just an error of understanding. Uh, there, there's many of you, your, your main sin is the fact of thinking you can live this life independent of Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's not possible. That is sin. Uh, for us to say that was Adam's and Eve's original sin. Uh, God gave them this beautiful garden with everything to enjoy. Restricted them by one tree. Just one. Uh, but yet in their, their, their independence and in their pride, uh, they, they wanted to live independent of God's rule. And that's the way you and I operate. But Jesus didn't operate that way. So it took uh, his death. He had to live sinless. Uh, the Bible says that uh, uh, death came from one man, that man being Adam, and life came from another, and, and that uh, life being Jesus Christ. Uh, and so the, my next point is, uh, we would all perish in our sins without God's intervention. Every one of us. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so th there's a payment. There's always payday. Uh, and so sin requires its wages. Sin doesn't just come free. Uh, now, we can freely sin. It's real easy to sin, but, but sin doesn't come free. There's always a cost. Uh, they tell, I've never been on one, but they tell me you get on a cruise ship, and they, they just give you this little tab. And, and so all the cruise, the whole week, you, you, you want to get a little uh, souvenir. You want to go here. You just put it on your tab, put it on your tab. And if you don't keep careful record of what you put on your tab, when you get off the ship and you're ready to go home, there's a large, large bill. You see, it felt free all week. You didn't pay for anything. Never got your wallet out. Never opened your checkbook. Never pulled out your credit card. But there came a day that you had to pay. And that's the way it is with sin. Some of you are young and strong and you're not thinking about uh, paying for your sin yet. You're not thinking about the, the end of life issues. And uh, so, so you're freely living, uh, living, uh, living it up if you would. Uh, but I can assure you, sin requires wages. Uh, and it will be paid for. It's one thing sin does. Uh, sin is sort of like a mafia boss. You will pay. And so we see both you and I will pay its price. Uh, for all eternity, if, if, if we just pay for it ourselves. But you see, Jesus Christ... Gave a payment for our sin. He paid it. Now, giving you that example I gave you a minute ago about the cruise ship. And you're coming off the cruise ship and you have the big bill. And the guy behind you says, don't worry about it, sir. I'll pick up your tab. Somebody else paid. Your, uh, you know, you're the one who deserved to pay for that. Those were things you, 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 it's your souvenirs. It was your meals. It was your uh, jet ski rides. It, it was all you that uh, enjoyed it. But someone else paid for it. Uh, what a free feeling. What a great feeling that is. And that's the way our life is. Uh, once again, we're, we're all going to draw our last breath. Two people a second. 155,000 people a day. We're all going to draw our last breath. And, and there's a payment. There's a bill there. Uh, and so, death is part of the human condition. But eternal life is God's gift. That's what it said. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life. 
God does not want you to die in your sin. Uh, God recognizes that you're a sinner, but he took initiative to give you something for your sin. Uh, what a Savior. No wonder they call him Savior. Uh, God took the initiative. I, the only thing I have given God is failure. But, but he took the initiative. He's going to cover that. And uh, he says... Uh, that, that if we repent of our sins. Now, now there's not, I'm not teaching universal salvation here. Uh, God doesn't just save you because of the fact you're a human being and you're a nice person. Uh, you have to repent of your sins. You have to come to him and you have to admit that you're a sinner. And, and you, ha you have to uh, admit that he is Lord. That he lived a sinless life. And you have to believe that he died at Calvary. And you have to believe that he laid in tomb three days. And you have to believe he came out alive. Those are all, all requirements. But if you've done that, and I hope you have, but if you haven't done that, uh, you can do that now. Or if you wait to end this sermon, we're going to give you a chance. We're going to make a, a public plea for that. Uh, but but th that, that sin's paid for. Now, that doesn't mean that we should say because he's paying the tab we keep. Matter of fact, Paul says uh, it, that the fact that we understand that Christ paid for our sins shouldn't uh, motivate us to sin more. He says, God forbid. It actually should, uh, uh, in, in gratitude, uh, cause us to, to try to sin less. To, to spend effort. Uh, to, to, to bring ourselves into subjection. Uh, the good news is that no matter how great our sins. I know there's somebody here saying, well, that's fine for you, Pastor Jim. And that's fine for, for my wife and my grandmother. You know, but, but somebody here and, and, and you look and you said, I committed a great, great sin. Uh, the Bible says no matter how great your sins, uh, uh, it says that God will go to the uttermost. Uh, one of the wags said to the guttermost. Uh, no matter how deep your sin, God's grace will go deeper. And so, uh, don't say that uh, there's, there's two people, listen to me right now. One, that doesn't consider herself a great, great enough sinner to, to want Jesus to intervene on their behalf. And then we have another group uh, that considers herself such a great sinner that you don't think God would intervene on your behalf. And both, both parties need to, to reason here. Both parties need to consider the fact that Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe, came and died for sinners. And the Bible says uh, that we are all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we all like to point out other sin. It's easy for me to point out sins of, of someone else. But the fact is that I got to accept that I'm a sinner. I have, I have sinned. And so, uh, but a Christian's, uh, uh, the fact that if you're a Christian and you've uh, put your faith in Jesus Christ, I mentioned a moment ago, and I'm sure you weren't too gleeful about it. I'm not too excited about the numbers either. Uh, two, seconds, uh, two persons a second, I always wonder which second's meant for me, uh, go into eternity. But a Christian's last day of this life will become the best day of his life. Now that's hard to accept. But if you've received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Then when you draw your last breath. When, when these lungs are finally through taking in air. And when this heart is finished beating. Uh, that will be quote quote my last day. We, you know I'm not skirting the issue. Death. If death came to me. And if the scripture, solo scriptura, is true, then we must accept also that that becomes my best day. Because now I go into a world, to a heavenly reign of Jesus Christ that doesn't have sin. And it's free of sin. And so I want you to hold your markers in 1 Corinthians. I hope you're at home with your Bibles open. And at this point, I want to turn to the book of John, the third chapter. If you would, now that you're in John chapter 3, if you look at the 16th verse, probably a, a very familiar verse to most of you. But I want you to keep going with me from the 16th to the 17th verse. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, and John 3.16, as I share with you, is very familiar, but many people stop there. 
I imagine all of you listening to me have heard John 3.16. Matter of fact, you've probably seen it on little, little place cards and people have it on their refrigerator and you've, you've heard it quote. It's one of the first verses I learned as a child. Uh, but John 3.17 is the message. Uh, if you would, John 3.16 is in a basket and that basket is John 3.17. Just as important. And I want you to, to read that with me. For God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now think about this. Uh, God didn't, didn't come to condemn. It would have been easy for God to condemn. Matter of fact, at Calvary, when he was dying, one of his last cries, uh, uh, some have said there was seven cries at the cross, seven recorded cries. I've heard sermons on the seven cries. Matter of fact, I think I might have even presented one on the seven cries at Calvary. But one of the cries that he made, and, and one of the most unique, if you would, considering the surroundings and consider the circumstance, he had a crowd that was laughing at his death. He had a crowd that was, had, had, had thrown insults to him, a crowd that was making fun of him. And in the midst of that, he pleaded to his father to forgive those people because they knew not what they were doing. Now think about that. God, the heart of God is not one of condemnation. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we're condemned already. The human condition is one of condemnation. Nobody questions that. Uh, the sin nature that is passed, uh, passed on from child to child, uh, the sin nature will condemn you. Uh, because when sin happens, now there's an age of accountability. No one knows exact date. I can't give you that, that age of accountability. I, I'm not sure. Uh, once, once if you're out there and you're young, uh, you might be young, but if you're aware that you're a sinner, you've passed the age of accountability, trust me. Uh, I'm not sure what that age of accountability is. Uh, but there's a point in our life where we know we're sinners. And so we're condemned already. Not only are we sinners, but we're aware we're sinners. And so the condemnation comes. God isn't the one condemning us. Sin condemns us. But look, read with me again. That he, he came that the world through him might be saved. Jesus Christ came, if you would, on a rescue mission. Uh, right now, uh, many of you know, we have a virus going around our world. And, and there's people on the front line. There's doctors and nurses and ambulance drivers and, and policemen. And, and, and they're right there. Many of us are in our homes, uh, safe away, uh, keeping away distance, uh, social distancing, they call it. Uh, many of us are practicing that and, and safe in that environment. But because the, the nature of their jobs and nature of their calling, there they are in emergency rooms, people coming in uh, with the virus or people coming in with other things. And, and, and they're there on a rescue mission. They're there to help. Uh, you're in need and there they are. And we thank God for them and we should be praying for them. Uh, but the Bible says that's what Jesus did. He came on a rescue mission. Uh, we were in need and there he was. Uh, if you would, if you'll go back to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, the, the Bible says in the heart of heaven is a physical body of a deity overseeing everything. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 47 uh, says this. Uh, the 47th verse says, The first man of the earth is earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. The Lord from heaven. He, he came out of the grave not as a spirit, but a body. And you say, well, how do you know that? Once again, solo scriptura says that there was 500 witnesses here in 1 Corinthians that the disciples add plus the disciples plus the, uh, the, the two men to the road of Emmaus. Uh, uh, we keep going. Matter of fact, there's been some saying that if you gave every witness of Jesus' resurrection uh, five minutes to testify that it would take over five days of testimony. That's how many physical witnesses. Now, nobody can see a spirit, but everyone can see a body. Jesus Christ came out of the grave, not in spirit, but in body. And so, uh, he is in heaven, and when we get to heaven, you won't see God the Father, you won't see the Holy Spirit, but you will see Jesus Christ, the body of God, forever, all eternity. 
right now in heaven. He is, he is overseeing all. You know, see, God's love is sacrificial. And it's available to all who will receive it. Uh, didn't know what John 3.16 said? Whoever shall believe. Uh, so if you're listening to me, you say, well, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I, I, I don't know one Bible chapter from the other. I, I don't know the book. I think there's a book called Genesis. I think I've seen it sometime. Uh, isn't it wonderful? God doesn't require Bible verses. God doesn't require a Christian heritage. All God requires is for you to receive his pardon. And that's what he's given you. He's given you a pardon. Uh, you see, receive love always changes the recipient. I, I look at my life and, and, and here in this church, people, uh, people have showed love to their pastor. And it changes the way the pastor uh, looks at the church. Uh, you look in your family. Uh, my wife, I, I, she's given me love. And that receive love has changed me. My children, my grandchildren, uh, parents, brother. You go down the list, family members. I mean, there's people. When you receive love, it changes you. And, and that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to change you through his love. Uh, Jesus is offering a pardon. I'm going to bring the sermon to an end. But I'm going to caution you. Please, please. Do, be, do not be like George Wilson. I'm, I'm going to read you an article. In 1829, a Pennsylvania man named George Wilson, with an incompetence, robbed a U.S. mail carrier, endangering the mail carrier's life in the process. Both men soon were captured. They were brought to trial and they were found guilty. In those days of stricter punishment, both were sentenced to be hanged. The accomplice was hanged in 1830, but Wilson had influential friends who took action on his behalf. They got the attention of President Andrew Jackson, who granted Wilson a presidential pardon less than a month before the scheduled execution. George Wilson, however, refused it, and, and the authorities did not know what to do. The matter eventually reached the U.S. Supreme Court. In the court's ruling, Chief Justice John Marshall stated the following, A pardon is an act of grace. And for that act to become official, it must be received by the recipient. Uh, George Marshall refused that pardon. And George Marshall died from hanging. Uh, for Christ's pardon on your behalf to be completed, you must receive it. The pardon's granted. John 3, 16, 17 just told us he granted us a pardon. He came. He died at Calvary. And he said, if you will believe that, if you'll, you'll put your heart and belief in me and you'll, you'll repent of your sins, I will redeem you. I'll make you one of my children. But the pardon's there. But just like uh, Chief Justice uh, John Marshall stated, a pardon is an act of grace, but for that act to become official, for you to be saved of your sins, you must receive the pardon. The recipient must receive. Uh, will you accept that pardon today? Will you make that part of your life? Jesus Christ came. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, you, you're, you're the whosoever. Will you accept that pardon? I want to bring one more point. If you can bear with me for, uh, for, for about two moments, we will, we will bring this sermon to a completion. In 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus' resurrection gives us victory over death. I described earlier. 155,000 people a day dying worldwide. You know, uh, many people are concerned uh, about a virus and, and the death rate. And that death rate is high by number. But can I tell you that the same day that maybe uh, four, five, six in a state would pass from the virus, maybe 40 uh, from something else or cancer or, or car accidents or, or various things. Death is universal. Death will come to all of us. Uh, 
And so uh, I want you to look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, 57. Very strange title. All death, where is thy sting? All grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Uh, though our natural thought process, you cannot talk death. Nobody makes fun of death. But spiritually, we can say, death will come, but it has no victory. It has no power over us. There's no power anymore. Oh, yes, they will put this bag of bones in the ground. But as Paul said, these, this, these bones will, will reform a body someday at the hand of God. God will somehow, how he does it, I don't know. But, but all these uh, uh, decomposed bodies all over the world, he, he will reframe them. He will put some kind of eternal body on them. And he will bring them out of the graves. And you see, we can't believe any of that. Uh, unless Jesus Christ was the first fruit. Uh, and so in closing, I want to share with you, the same God who emptied Jesus Christ's grave will one day empty your grave if you are a redeemed saint of God. So at this time, I'm going to ask you, uh, don't be like George Wilson. George Wilson in 1830 hung from his neck. Because he refused a pardon. And I'm going to tell you, there's no universal salvation. It makes no difference what grandmother's done on your behalf. It makes no difference what you did as an infant. It makes no difference in any capacity. There is no universal salvation. Only those who have in repented faith as Jesus Christ, forgiven their sins, come in a heart and live, have hope. It's a pardon. Uh, the whosoever will is you. Will you receive the pardon? If you're willing to receive that pardon in your living room, or in your garage, wherever you may be right now, uh, would you just join me? Let's all bow our heads. Father, uh, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come to your majestic throne. Father, we ask that you would be uh, with each person here. And Father, we ask that you would uh, touch, their, touch their life, touch their heart. And Father, we ask that whatever is accomplished, in word and deed, it be to your son's praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.